how to make a pickle? I don't. Well, at least I've never made any myself. I have the basic concept of how they're made, and in taking to YouTube, it was confirmed to me that my basic understanding on the matter is in fact correct. So first we need a jar, a clean one. It's usually been boiled for about 12, 12 minutes, not hours, minutes. <laughs> Uh, then we've got our spices, and depending on what type of pickles we're making, these might be different. But for our imaginary pickle jar today, we're going to just put in some dill and garlic. We're going to keep it simple. Next, we have cucumbers. We put those in the jar. And then comes the brine. Pickling salt, water, vinegar, all boil together to make a wonderful substance that is brine. We pour it right into the jar, throw the top on, and voila! We have pickles, right? Or, or do we? See, right now, if we open up our imaginary jar, we won't find pickles. Instead, we find cucumbers bathing in brine. And these cucumbers won't become pickles for some time. Traditionally, it takes at least two weeks, if not six weeks, for these cucumbers to become pickles. Sure, maybe if we pull up the cucumber and eat it super fast before the brine drips off, it'll taste a little different, not like cucumber. It, it, it might taste good. Cucumbers are fairly tasty vegetables. They're, but they're not pickles. So why am I talking to you about pickles? Well, let's turn to Luke 10 and see if you can figure it out before I get to the end. So, in Luke 10, we've got some context. So the time of Jesus to be taken up to heaven is approaching, and so he, along with his, his disciples, have set out for Jerusalem. In Luke 9:57, to where we're going to read today, Luke has been weaving together a tapestry of what it looks like for someone to follow Christ, what their life looks like. Right before today's passage, Jesus has told the story of the Good Samaritan and given the people listening quite a shock. In, this par in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Samaritan's a good guy. Jesus turns the listener's idea of who their neighbor is on its head. And now comes the passage we'll be talking about today, Luke 10, 38 to 42. Perhaps this story is placed there just in case people were getting the idea from the last story that you can have faith by works. This story sorts out any misunderstanding there pretty quick. So, Luke 10, 38 to 40 reads, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the feet of the Lord, listening to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with so much serving. Jesus and his disciples had not only come to Martha's town, but to her house. She had a very special opportunity to serve Jesus. She was doing what was expected of her, fulfilling her duty as put out before her, preparing a great meal for those in her house. She was doing something good, something that needed to be done. I'm sure all of us would agree food is important. We enjoy it. But in all that she expected herself to do, or possibly what she felt was expected of herself to do, Martha began to panic. Her wanting to do something special for Jesus was a good option, but not the best option. Dwelling in God's truth is better than any good thing. Martha just couldn't see that yet. The end of verse 40 reads, And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone? Tell her to help me. I'm sure many of us with siblings can imagine Martha's frustration. Martha is doing all the work, and her sister, the one who should be helping her, is sitting on the ground while Martha runs off her feet trying to get things ready. Imagine it, there's company over and one of your parents asks you to do some, something and like the perfect child you are, you go and you do it. You come back to spend time in the presence of company, but again, you're sent to go do something. Not, uh, now these things aren't small, they're pretty large tasks. And as you're asked to go do these things, one or more of your siblings are sitting around in the same room. They haven't been asked. Wouldn't it rise up in you to say something? How, how is it that your parent just allows your sibling to sit there while you go and do all the work? Helps us feel a little bit for Martha. She's doing all the work and it is good. Anyone walking by the house would say, yeah, go Martha, good job. And so Martha asks Jesus, don't you care? If we look at this a little bit deeper, we might see her asking, Lord, look, care. See the work that I'm doing. See my worth. And how often are we also like Martha in this way, saying to God and others, see my works. Look at how well I have done. Surely now I'm worth being loved. Surely now, Lord, I'm acceptable to have your son die for me. But 
if we look at what Jesus has to say to Martha's frustration, we find. In verse 41 it says, But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Did you catch that? Martha, Martha. He says her names twice. There's significance in this. Whenever Jesus says something or someone's name twice, he's about to say something really significant, something to pay attention to. Jesus replies tenderly to Martha, not berating her for tattling on Mary or telling Mary to get after the work that Martha has been doing for the both of them. His response is not to what Mary is, is not what Mary, Martha is expecting, but he gives it to her gently, still caring for her. He first addresses what she is doing, not her actions, but her attitude about it. She has become worried and upset. Through his ministry, Jesus taught his disciples not to be worried or anxious, for their loving Father in heaven would care for their every need. In Matthew 6, Jesus instructs his disciples to seek the kingdom of God, not the things they may need for the future. Here he is addressing the same thing. Martha is worried, but Jesus directs her vision back to where it should be. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Being in relationship with God, dwelling in his truth, is much better than any good activity. Mary made the decision to sit at the feet of Christ and listen to him teach. Martha chose to allow herself to get worried over a meal and what her sister is not doing. She was preparing the meal, which is good. But Jesus is saying to her, sit at my feet and devour my teachings. There is no more important meal than this, no more important portion. This concept of an everlasting portion goes back to the Old Testament. In Psalms, we read of this concept of an everlasting portion. Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 142, 5, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Mary is partaking in the right meal, the right portion. What she has done sitting at Christ's feet will last and will remain with her now and through eternity. Jesus is calling Martha to that same thing. This goes against the understanding of the culture, just as the story before this passage with the Good Samaritan does. As a woman, Mary and Martha should be preparing a meal, but there is something so much more important going on around that she should be participating in instead. And in going against cultural norm, Jesus continues to show that he cares for all people and that dwelling in God's truth is better than any good thing, no matter who you are. Good works have their place, but just not the first place. When we read the story, we can get caught up in seeing Martha as good, uh, Mary as good, and Martha as bad. But the dedication Martha shows in attempting to serve Christ and his disciples shows something of Martha's character. She is loyal and has a steadfast faith. She just has her priorities mixed up. In this passage, Jesus tells Martha that there's only one thing that is needed. She is focused on many things, good things, but not the best thing, being with Jesus, doing in God's truth. In our own lives, we don't often find ourselves caught between that which is glaringly bad and that which is good. I don't know about you, but I don't often find myself thinking, hmm, what should I keep, my Bible reading or this Ponzi scheme I'm running? Instead, we have all these good things vying for our time we find ourselves having to choose between multiple good things. We are spending time with family, caring for friends, giving back to the community, running important errands, doing devos and praying, and so many good things. The good things pull at us each and every direction, and we simply don't have enough time to do it all. As these things build up, the things we often let go of are the things we shouldn't, like our relationship with those around us, and most importantly, our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus said that only one thing is needed, his truth, which we find in his teachings. Martha's choice was good, but Mary's was better. She took a look at the situation, saw that Jesus was in the house, and that being with Jesus was more important, the most important thing she could do. Most of us try to serve God without listening to him. Serving is good, and there will be a time for that, but dwelling in God's truth and learning to obey it and submit to it is better than any good thing. So what does this look like? Like we said, most of us aren't struggling between two big extremes, but instead all these good things that take up place, take, take up space. I don't know about you, but I can tend to allow the good things to take up that space in my life. 
Some of them I genuinely want to do. Some of them I say yes to because they continue to perpetuate this idea and this image that I want others to have of me. And some things I do because I want to show God that I'm worthy of his love. I want to prove to him that I'm good enough. It's like I'm saying, see my good works. Look at how well I have done. Surely now I'm worth being loved. Surely now I'm acceptable of having your son die for me. I seem to have forgotten the fact that Romans 8, 37 to 39 states nothing can separate us from the love of God. But it can feel easier to stay a baptized cucumber, just dipping into the brine of God's word than it is to become a pickle. If I become a pickle, it means sitting in his brine in God's truth. And it's going to change me to the very core of myself. I'll no longer be a cucumber. I'll no longer be in control. But look at Jesus' words to Martha. Mary has chosen better, and it will not be taken away from her. Our good things will pass away. Cucumbers get moldy and all mushy. But pickles, the brine preserves them. Let us look at our lives. What are we keeping in our lives for the wrong reason? Trying to look good or fulfilling society's expectations of us. Filling our lives with good things so that we don't have to spend time with God or stuck in the lie of working out what makes us working or stuck in the lie of working to make ourselves worthy of his love. What good thing in our lives has edged out the best? We're called to be disciples, to be like Mary, choosing the best thing. Dwelling in God and with God is better than any good thing. We need to be pickles, not baptized cucumbers. May we not be okay with just being dipped in the truth here and there. Let's shove ourselves into that jar, have the truth brine poured over top of us and change who we are. May we be pickles.